artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Welcome to episode 161. Today we're going to conclude the interview with Roman Yampolsky, professor of computer science at the University of Louisville in Kentucky, where he is also the director of the Cybersecurity Laboratory. He has published so much in the field of AI safety for so long that he is largely responsible for the field having that term. He's written numerous papers and books, including Artificial Intelligence, a Futuristic Approach in 2015, and Artificial Intelligence, Safety and Security in 2018. Last week, we talked about what's really going on, with the letters calling for a pause on AI development or calling out its existential threat, how much we're progressing towards artificial general intelligence, and that existential threat as a result of the releases of GPT-2, 3, and 4, and how much Roman feels like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the movie Don't Look Up, which you should totally see. It's one of my favorites. Here we go, back to the interview with Roman Yampolsky. A while ago, you came up with the clever idea that a way of distinguishing an AI from a human, if you were dealing with it through some interface that didn't let you obviously observe the blinking lights, but that this was something that was capable of vision would be to present an optical illusion to it and see if it had the same reaction as a person. Do you think that's still going to be a, a useful test? So that was for telling if an agent has consciousness state similar to humans. If they experience an illusion, then I have to agree that they have something, either a model of a human mind or independently mm. conscious component to them. So I think it's still interesting to see if we can run this. We tried automating process of creating illusions a couple of years ago. Back then it wasn't feasible. What we generated was complete crap. So I would love to see someone right now with the latest models try to automate process of generating novel mm -hmm. visual illusions or even audio illusions, other types of modalities and administering it to those tests and humans and see if they can experience parts of the image which are not there, there in your mind, really. If you see something rotating, size is different, then it's not coming from the direct observation of data. Right. And because to humans, the optical illusion works because our visual system is operating at biological limits and has to optimize for some things and optimizes for dealing with a real world and when you present it things that aren't part of a real world then it gets confused but i wonder whether a version of a large language model or its successor would actually have been trained on enough data that it would effectively recognize an optical illusion and say this is how a human would respond to it and i'll do the same so I think we had some experiments with earlier neural networks where they had same bugs as biological neural networks. And so they did experience some of those simple illusions in the same way. If this is similar enough to human model, and it seems to be trained on human language, so it might be human produced art, so it might be. The limitation of the test is that it only looks for same thing we experience. If it experienced something different, something even more complex, we would not know that. We would not have an equivalent. So it could still mm -hmm. be conscious even if it fails to show similar experiences as a human, just perhaps super consciousness. The example that is prompting this line of thinking for me is the Winograd schema, which was once thought to be a useful test of whether something, well, differentiating AI from human. The prototypical example was giving the sentence, the city councilman refused to demonstrate as a permit because they feared violence. Ask the question, who feared violence? And then change one word, the city councilman refused to demonstrate as a permit because they advocated violence. Who advocated violence? You get a different answer each time because you have to understand the difference between how city councilmen and demonstrators think and behave, which looked foolproof. But ChatGPT gets it right, even when you make up Winograd schemas that can't be in its training data. And again, that's where it, its performance exceeds, for me, the explanation of how it works. 
So is that hinting at perhaps some, I don't know, model of language, something that we don't understand about language rather than how the AI is working? It could be, and that's kind of a part of research I'm doing, showing that there is this emergent, unexplained phenomenon which can always still hide there. At no point do we know that for sure we fully understood this artificial agent. Say more about that then. You're talking about the possibility of something evolving in an AI that we don't recognize? So historically... Then we created AI. It was engineering effort. We explicitly knew what we're doing. It's an expert system. This is the list of words we put in, database. Now it's more of a science. We let the system learn on its own from the data. And then we start experimenting with it to see what it's capable of. But just like science in a natural world, you never know if you're going to discover additional laws of physics. You never know if there is hidden constants. You know that so far, this is what you discovered. This is the capabilities. Is it possible that GPT-4, properly prompted, does something completely awesome we don't know about? Absolutely. What sort of signs do you think are worth looking for, useful to look for, to tell whether something is evolving into artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence? I'm mean, thinking maybe a bit down the road, but that's what you do all the time. Well, I believe that once we have general, we'll get super almost right away. Just it already has all this infinite memory, essentially, access to internet, right. multi-parallel execution. So once we get through ability to do science and engineering, we're basically at super intelligence levels right away. Sorry, my, so my question is more, are there any sort of monitors and sensors, things that we could position around AIs as they're being trained that would detect signs that it was evolving towards something more capable than we want to deal with? That's a great question. So that's a paper I finished last week. I have not announced it yet. It's already on ResearchGate. So if you look for unmonitorability of artificial intelligence, you'll get the paper. And my understanding is, no, we can't monitor it live to fully understand mm -hmm. what it's capable of, what it's doing. It's not something we'll be able to do. And it's a long paper. There's 30 pages of reasons why I think it's exactly that. In fact, I worked with GPT-4 on uh, completing this paper, my first collaboration with AI. At that level, I had a kind of joke paper in uh, a couple of years ago with GPT-2, which was just complete garbage, whereas this one is pretty real. I would say it's as good as a average graduate student in terms of its ability to work with ideas, to help write them out, to copy edit. But uh, you guessed correctly, that's the research direction I'm looking at right now. Limits to monitoring AI development, deployment, continuous learning, because it's so important for all the governance proposals we're starting to see. So that first word was unmonitorability? Okay. Of artificial intelligence, yeah. So completing that sequence of papers and different limits. So explainability is a problem, mm -hmm. our ability to comprehend, predictability, and now, yes. And were you saying that you had an AI co-write the paper? Uh, yeah, I generated ideas. And for many of them, I asked uh, GPT-4 to write out that idea with some guidance. It was, as I said, as good as any graduate student I ever had. Are you listing it as a co-author? I did it for GPT-2 a couple of years ago. I was ahead of the curve. Now mm -hmm. it's no longer hot and cute. So I just acknowledge it as a contributor right. and claim all the remaining errors and G. Is, it, is your paper proving that we can't monitor everything that could happen or that we can't monitor anything? So obviously we can monitor some things. It'd be insane to say that there is nothing we can know, but mm -hmm. specifically what people call emergent capabilities, mm -hmm. capabilities which either don't show up in earlier models or show up so weakly we don't know to test them. That doesn't seem like something we can monitor live. We need... To right. Stop the training run, start testing, start playing with it to see if it actually does. But are there still useful things that we could do, even if we can't solve it completely? I mean, thinking like traveling salesman problem, you can prove that you can't come up with the optimal solution, but you can also prove that you can come close. There is absolutely useful things we can monitor for, and they're different. Again, I have a taxonomy of what we monitor. Is it uh, resource consumption? Is it some sort of social capabilities? But the problem is because it's a more and more general multimodal system, you need to design specific tests. You need to know what to look for. You need to know 
what it is you're searching for before you can find it. And that takes time. Mm. So you can apply an existing test. But again, you, you have to stop training. You have to actually run the test. So that's not exactly life monitoring of a training run. Right. And then once the system is deployed, it's not just a system. It's what plugins it has access to, internet access, what the users interacting with it give it. So it's more what I think David Chalmers calls extended mind mm. hypothesis, where it's not just a model, but model within an environment with different affordances, different goals, of course. Somebody showed it specific examples. Now it has new capability the trained model didn't have before. Mm. So I think it's an interesting area to look at. Uh, there are certain things we can easily monitor. Some we can kind of get partial feeling for what's happening. But for many, I think we will never fully understand all capabilities of that model because we are just not experts in all the possible domains. And you've been staking out positions in this space for some years now. And I think the utility of that is becoming more apparent. So thank you for that. I wondered whether the sentence saying AI poses a risk was prompted by some of the people who are building it, looking at the things that people have been doing with chat GPT and so forth and thinking, we well, never thought anyone would do that. And a lot of that academic thinking about existential risk some years ago would lead to conclusions like, let's make sure that no one does this because that would be really dangerous and obviously no one would be that stupid. And if the last four months have proven anything, it's that, yes, we are that stupid. What sort of things have you seen in that space? I'm going to joke and say that nobody could have predicted that except like five years ago, yes. we published paper on how to feed <laughs> malevolent AI and exactly what we predicted. Every possible worst case scenario right. within a week, people connected it to the internet, made it an agent, gave it a goal of destroying humanity. So all these things we're worried about, should we keep it in a box? Should we release it? None of it actually became useful. We immediately yes. skipped all those safety stages and went to what's the worst that people can do? Let's give it access yes. to 8 billion humans and see if they can mess it up. Yeah, the, the last words of the human race might be some developer saying, hold my beer. And there was someone who hooked it up to a system that they had coded to monitor the error messages when it crashed automatically decide what code to change, recompile it, and launch it again. Again, from an academic point of view, I look at that and go, <clears throat> that's a cool idea. It's also a what could go wrong kind of idea. It's not quite recursive self-improvement, though, because it's not doing it to the large language model itself. Do you think, I hesitate to ask this, but I can't resist, do you think it's possible to make a version of a large language model that could recursively train itself? I think it's possible, but I also think it may not be necessary. As I said, we don't really fully know how advanced the model is until we stop training and test it. So it's possible that we are so close to human level that the next run will take us beyond that. Mm. But I think GPT-4 was trained for six months if they accurately reported that. So let's say six months of training with 100x more compute, 1000x, can easily take us from where we are right now, let's say estimated IQ of 100, hypothetically, to 200, 300, which is already without any self-improvement, a system which is a very worthy adversarial opponent. Exactly. Eliezer Yudkovsky has been making a lot of media appearances recently with his views. And if I characterize them correctly, he's essentially demonstrating with considerable rigor, one, artificial intelligence will inevitably become artificial superintelligence. Two, artificial superintelligence will inevitably destroy the human race. And three, it's too late to stop that. And every time I hear him, the whole interview has a cast of great despondency around it at this hopelessness. Do you locate your position on some axis relative to him? Can you say, or do you want to characterize where you are relative to that? It's actually funny. Few people understand that he's an optimist. He thinks the problem is solvable. We just don't have enough time, enough brains, something is missing. I'm mm -hmm. saying it's unsolvable theoretically. It's not that he's not smart enough or wasted his time. It's just you can't indefinitely control godlike super intelligent machines of the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of to the right of the righteous. I don't know how to hmm. compare it. Okay. What do you think should be the next steps in furthering the cause of AI safety? 
I think the only option we have is self-interest. If people understand that pressing that button is not in their personal interest, right? Those uh, young men still have a lot to live for, rich, successful. They can have really good lives at this level. Mm -hmm. If they make a mistake and destroy the world, there is not even the glory of being a villain in history, right? There is no history left. So there is mm, not enough for them to gain to justify losing everything at this stage. Now I can see someone in their 90s about to die, no kids. Okay, maybe they would press the button. It makes sense logically. But for these people, I just don't see the necessity. Well, and you and I both have kids. What sort of conversations have you had with them, if any, about this? Oh, I, I talk to them. They they try to propose solutions. They haven't solved it yet. I'll let you know if they do. Anything interesting? I mean, they kids, they're kind of naive. They ask questions. Why do they develop dangerous technology? Don't they understand it's dangerous? Mm. Ah, welcome to this world. But it's not just dangerous. It's equally capable of curing cancer and everything else, right? That sets it apart from something like nuclear weapons, which don't have much use other than blowing up a city. Absolutely, 100%. And it's such an amazing technology. And that's why I said when you're 90, you should push the button. It's a rational decision. But it's not a matter of saying, let's just slow this down, let's turn it off, because it could solve some of the problems that are bedeviling us right now, like cancer. I and everyone I know has had that touch their lives in some way that makes us not want to get in the way of anything that could eliminate it. And so is there a way to have our cake and eat it too, to get that benefit without the... I mean, there's always a risk, Right. So this is a risk trade off the risk of destroying the world against the payoff of curing cancer. It's now a numbers game. How do we navigate that? So it seems like some companies, especially I'm thinking of DeepMind, managed to get amazing benefits by solving real scientific problems like protein folding, like novel algorithm design, without having to create AGI or super intelligence. We've already seen those breakthroughs. They have a new nature paper every time, something absolutely awesome, whatever it's just playing mm. Go or, again, such medical breakthrough, as I mentioned. So I think it may be possible to solve cancer and immortality with a much more narrow system. You don't have to have full-blown superintelligence to do that. Mm. But do you see us going down that road and essentially imposing a moratorium on the development of the more general models? Uh, again, I don't think government regulation ever works in practice. It's just not something we can monitor for, right? So even if there was a regulation saying you cannot train systems with the following capabilities, how would you ensure it's not happening? Also, right. training those models becomes easier and easier every year. So mm -hmm. very soon you have someone doing it at home on a desktop, on a laptop. Yeah. So I'm skeptical of just uh, government regulation for technical solutions. Self-interest is a different thing. Mm. I publish enough interesting results showing you cannot control this. It becomes mainstream view. Maybe more and more people will decide against doing it, at least the people running those large labs. That's my best hope for success here. Maybe it wouldn't be government. Again, the call for the slowdown, the call for the pause in training, and the statement about existential threat and who signed both of those didn't come from government. It really unprecedented in my experience for an industry to do that kind of thing. Is there any possibility? Do you think there's any likelihood of a self-regulation occurring here? So I think the first letter was from academia and the second one was also a research lab. So it was an industry initiating it and what they signed didn't kind of commit them to anything, saying, yeah. ah, I'm worried. Again, not a commitment. And as far as the six months, I don't think anyone signed a commitment saying they're not going to do it. Kind of by default, they weren't planning on training GPT-5 right away. So it worked out well, but I don't think it had actual kind of legal impact you would hope it did. Yeah, I could see that. Who do you think the audience for that was then? I think it's more about just showing how serious they are. If you have all the top scholars saying, you know, it's very important to slow down, to take it seriously, that already sends important message to politicians, to our scholars. You don't want it to be just this one crazy guy in Kentucky. You want it to be a right. community, a movement. Then perhaps government is one of the audience for 
these messages? And do you think government is going to take that as the signal for creating regulation? They seem to be at least willing to take meetings now. And there are some conferences. I think UK government is organizing something with US government to discuss it. Historically, I think they're going to produce a wrong kind of answer to the problem. They might allocate more funds for AI research centers or mm. spend more on uh, the problems we discussed, such as, okay, algorithmic bias, whereas the letter is very explicit about existential nature of yeah. the concerns. Well, it does seem to have changed the conversation some among government. The British Columbia Green Party called on the party in power to set up an AI task force for the province and the Green Party invited me to come in and talk to their leader and members about this. We had a great conversation. They went into the existential issue and uh, we were talking about things that a year ago would have been fringe kooks and they were dead serious about this and wanted to understand all of the issues and the sort of things that we've been talking about here. So that narrative, that conversation has certainly changed. Well, we're approaching the end of our time here, and it's been another fascinating conversation. I love talking with you. You're right out on the edge of AI safety, which a few years ago looked a lot more fringe, and now it looks like, hey, you were prophetic, and you got there first. What's next? Well, no one's going to gloat about predicting the end of the world. So that's not something we want to accomplish. The hope is that just like everyone now seems to be on board with how serious the problem is, existential risks. I want more people to take some time to see if a problem, the problem we described, is actually solvable. There is no publications outside of what I do. There is no right. mathematical proofs. There is no philosophical argumentation. Convince us that at least in theory, we can do something about it. And then we can pour more resources, financial, human resources. But if it's not solvable, then our strategy should be completely different. The work on AI safety and risk up until now seems to be quite fragmented. You've got institutes here and there with one to $10 million of funding. You've got you as a, a sole concern. Do you see any sign of this becoming more organized, more funded, centralized in any way? It's definitely growing. There are now, as I said, conferences at top universities, MIT, Berkeley, they all really getting into it. But the field of AI research and development outside of safety is doing the same. They're growing hyper exponential. The funding is bigger than it ever was. So as a kind of proportion of overall budget, safety is still tiny. Right. Someone puts $10 million into AI safety and it's headline news. And at the same time, Microsoft is throwing $10 billion at open mm -hmm. AI. And that's one of many similar sized efforts one imagines are going on around the world. Well, thanks for the conversation. What would you like to leave us with in terms of where we should be looking next at work that you've done, books, papers that are already out or coming out? I'll be definitely posting on social media, Facebook and Twitter. I'll share the paper I mentioned about monitorability soon. Stay connected. I think the next fire alarm to look for is AI being able to make jokes. When we have a stand-up comedian who is an artificial intelligence, the end is close. Well, it might be, at least we go out laughing, but I've seen the large language models generate some funny stuff already. Uh, so I challenged people to give me an example of something actually funny, and they all commented, well, that was funny to me, but no one else laughed. If you know an actual original joke by AI, please, I need one example. Do you know the one, it's not chat GPT, but do you know the one that came out that the researchers of Mina published some years ago where it made the joke about horses go to Havard? That wasn't in the training I data. I am not aware of it, but I was hoping it would be one of those language models producing it, given it's a language model and jokes okay. seem to be exactly the type of thing they should be excelling at. Fair enough. Okay. Another good test, although perhaps a little challenging to measure. Thanks, Roman, for coming on AI and You. Thank you so much. That's the end of the interview. The joke I was referring to near the end was in a paper by Google researchers, about five years ago, I want to say, about their chatbot called Mina, which at one point had this conversation with one of the researchers. Mina, which animal do you like? Human. 
I like cows. Mina. I heard they go to college. Human. Cows go to college? Mina. I heard that a cow went to Harvard. Human. What did the cow study? Mina. Bovine science. Human. Do horses ever go to college? Mina. Horses go to Havard. Human. That's a pretty good joke. I feel like you led me into it. Mina. You were trying to steer it elsewhere. I can see it. As the commentary on this Riley states, quote, Mina executes a multi-turn joke. We were unable to find this example in the training data, end quote. Meaning that in the text it was trained on, there was no joke about Havard. Or at least I found it funny enough to remember. You can find the paper by googling for Mina, M-E-E-N-A, and Havard. Anyway, it's great having Roman on the show, and he really is doing a fantastic job of raising awareness about the risks of AI, not by banging a drum and making vague pronouncements, but doing solid, verifiable academic research from his platform as a computer science professor and computer security expert. I've been in a great many conversations about the future of education, now that ChatGPT has demolished the viability of just about every kind of standardized test on the planet. That's because its output is at least as good as an average student in most, if not all, cases, and as good as an exceptional student in many cases. It's accomplished that demolition, because if the test is a viable means of measuring how good a student is to enter some field of employment, it means that the job can now be done by ChatGPT, so the student should instead be learning how to run ChatGPT, or how to do a different job. If, on the other hand, the test is not a viable means of measuring the student's employability, and that in fact depends on other factors, then what's the point of the test? It's not the usefulness of the student that's being demolished here, it's the usefulness of the educational assessment system. Anyway, to take a tangent to that, to one of my pet peeves about the teaching of math in schools, I want to editorialize for a bit. I've seen a lot of schools announce how pedagogically progressive they are by teaching math only in relevant contexts, i.e. showing it being useful for real-world problems. So calculus is only taught by showing how velocity gives you the rate of change of position of a car, for instance, or quadratic equations are only shown as a way of predicting the path of a falling ball. All this sounds very helpful, student-centered, and getting away from the dry past where math was taught as equations and theorems on a blackboard without any apparent usefulness. Sounds right, doesn't it? But I think it neglects something important. And I can point that out by analogy with poetry. Is poetry taught with its relevance and usefulness to everyday problems? Or art? Is art appreciation linked to its value in navigating the problems we face in personal finance or meal planning? No, I hear you saying. Do a lot of imagining what people are saying when I'm recording this, since it's just me and a microphone. Poetry and art and music are not meant to be used, they're meant to be experienced, to move our emotions, to touch our souls. Fair enough. So, why not say the same about math? Because, and to some of you this won't be a surprise, I was one of the few kids in school who loved math for its own sake. They didn't put it in a lot of context of everyday relevance when I was a kid, and I didn't need that because pure math was already beautiful and it sang to me by itself without any help and it touched my soul through its patterns and beauty. Now, I'm not going to demand that every kid be expected to experience that same emotion when learning math, but then neither should anyone demand that kids experience that with art and poetry and music because it doesn't always do that. There are a lot of types of art, music and poetry that leave me cold. Fine. Kids should be exposed to them anyway in school because they don't know what they're going to love until they've been exposed to a wide enough variety of inputs. Just like getting them to eat food. What I am saying is that we shouldn't teach math as though it has no intrinsic beauty, as though it's just a dull chore that people have to endure like doing push-ups and we have to make it as least painful as possible. Because that framing will deny all the kids who are like I was And I'll grant you there may not be many, but we should defend the rights of minorities, and that's a minority whose right to experience math as touching their soul should be protected. And if you're thinking that's impossible to teach, then you probably had the wrong math teacher, one who found it dull and mystifying. Fortunately, I had a fantastic one. 
We wouldn't expect a poetry class to be taught by someone who didn't find poetry beautiful. Think about Dead Poet Society and Robin Williams. So why do we think it's okay for math to be taught by someone who finds it tedious? Anyway, enough of the soapbox. But it's not as tangential as it may sound, because we started out talking about the impact of ChatGPT on education. And one thing it can't do is feel love for a subject, the sort that will make you want to study and do that thing regardless of how good a computer is at it. Which we've seen is not just an issue for topics like math and computer programming, but ChatGPT can write poetry and Midjourney can compose art with the best of them. So this is central to an issue that's very raw right now. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, has developed a scoring system that quantifies human trust in AI systems. They have a paper that details two scores, user trust potential and perceived system trustworthiness. User trust measures things about the user, like demographics and computer experience. Perceived system trustworthiness measures things like user interface usability. There's a lot of detail around things like what sort of expectations there are on an AI system. One that makes medical diagnoses should be held to a higher standard than one that recommends the next movie to watch. So this is really useful because it contributes to putting some very soft but important factors on a numerical footing. And if anyone could be trusted to do that, it's NIST. Next week, my guest will be Ryan Donnelly, founder of Enzi Technologies, a UK AI risk management platform, who is going to tell us about his recent visit to 10 Downing Street to help the government manage its own AI risk and opportunity. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.